It's a great pleasure to be here today to talk to you guys about the archaeology of Sonora. It is a broad topic and uh, one that I'm not going to do justice in the time we have and hopefully I won't uh, drag it out too much. But uh, uh, I think it's uh, very important to be considering the archaeology of Sonora uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one of the main things is, uh, the you know, when I was first trained in archaeology and, and when some of the other professionals I see here who were trained at about the same time, uh, we were taught the archaeology of the Southwest is the story of the three little cultures and how they grew, uh, Hoakam, uh, Anasazi, and Mogion. And uh, this, is, this approach to understand the archaeology of the Southwest has been really challenged and, and kind of falling apart over the last 20 years or so. But really, when you bring Sonora into this discussion, uh, any sense of the archaeology of the Southwest being about three little cultures and how they, they grew becomes very, very uh, difficult to maintain or to understand. Uh, the Southwest culture area, as it is formally defined, those of us who work in Mexico prefer to call it the Southwest Northwest culture area because it's the Southwest of the United States and the Northwest of Mexico. Uh, includes all of the states, uh, Mexican states of Sonora and Chihuahua. So it, it about, well, left less than half, but a, a, a sizable proportion, I'm guessing, maybe 40% of what is the Southwest Northwest culture area lies in Mexico. But our amount, the amount of work that we've done there uh, in Northwest Mexico lags far, far behind uh, what has been done north of the border. And there's a couple of reasons for this. One is because uh, uh, U.S. archaeologists uh, often don't want to work in Mexico. It's a different country. It's a different language. Uh, you know, it's it's more difficult to do work there uh, if you're uh, an American, if you're from the U.S. Uh, Mexican archaeology. Uh, Mexico has a very well developed uh, history of archaeology, uh, with you know very good archaeologists. But the focus of, uh, of these people has traditionally been in Mesoamerica. Uh, the Great Pyramids in all of central, uh, central Mexico, the Maya region, and down here. And, you, and if you were a Mexican archaeologist, you built a career by working there. Uh, and so the, south, uh, the northwest of Mexico kind of fell in, fell in between. And uh, it fell in between what is easily the most archaeologically studied region in the world, which is the southwestern United States. Quite honestly, there's no place in the world that will compare to the intensity of archaeology here and Mesoamerica, which is also another region that's very intensely studied. Uh, but very little work uh, went on in, uh, in between, and there was a tendency to interpret the archaeology of Sonora and Chihuahua in terms of things going on elsewhere. So American researchers, U.S. researchers, would go down to Mexico and they would see patterns that related to what was going on in, in uh, uh, the United States. So that, for example, the, my, most of my work has been on the Trincheras tradition, which is kind of the, uh, I don't know, can I, uh, oh yeah, which is this, this right here. Oh no, you're not seeing the arrow, I'm sorry. Uh, anyway, if you look closely at the map just south of Arizona, you'll see the Trincheras tradition. And, um, you know, in the United States, people talked about Trincheras tradition as being kind of rural or hillbilly hohokam. Uh, <laughs> Uh, which, which I wish to assure you they are not, for a whole, 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 whole slate of reasons I don't have time to go into now. Uh, and uh, people came up from Mesoamerica and they saw this as being the outpost of the Chichimeca. Uh, so there, there was a tendency to interpret all of this in terms of what's going on someplace else. And this, is all, ch this all changes starting in the uh, 80s. Uh, first of all, with the uh, establishment of what's now known as the Centro Ina de Sonora in Hermosillo, and there's the Centro Ina de Chihuahua in Chihuahua City. Uh, and this, this focuses Mexican archaeologists in this region. And there, are, there were a number of uh, North American archaeologists, uh, U.S. archaeologists, and Canadian archaeologists who started working in northern Mexico, my, myself being one of them. So we've really uh, advanced quite a bit, and we've gotten away from this of looking at the region in terms of everywhere else, and we're more and more looking at the region in terms of uh, local developments and what's going on uh, in the region uh, in, in those terms. Uh, however, the intensity and volume of work remains uh, radically different. Uh, one of the, the best, things I can, best things I can give you that kind of summarizes that is currently in the state of Arizona, there are over 100,000 uh, archaeological sites recorded. And I don't even know what the exact number is, but it's way over 100,000. 
In Sonora, which is about two-thirds the size of the state of Arizona, we have 5,000 archaeological sites recorded. So the volume of archaeology is very different between the two areas. However, one reason that we uh, proposed and put together the volume of archaeology southwest on Sonora was because several things have happened in the last decade or so that are greatly increasing the amount of archaeology uh, that we have. And all of these things are centered on the uh, Central Ina de Sonora. Uh, and uh, they uh, include uh, more work by people coming down from the United States, such as Jim uh, and others. Uh, and they also include uh, uh, more commercial development, economic development in northern Mexico, resulting in more projects. Uh, so the Central Ina is, is uh, thriving, and they have archaeological projects running all over the state. Uh, we just had two major uh, gas aqueducto, a gas pipeline, sorry, I had to think what it was in English. Um, uh, they, they, we just had two major gas pipeline surveys and excavation projects done in Sonora, which are going to uh, give us a whole bunch more information. And we've gotten a number of, uh, of uh, research funded projects going on, including one that I'm involved with that's ongoing at the moment. So we are really getting uh, a lot more uh, going. One of the advantages of working, I think, in uh, Sonora or working in North Mexico is that Mexican archaeologists come to the context with very different perceptions than those of us trained in the United States. Uh, those of us trained in the United States, Southwestern archaeologists, uh, uh, you know, whether, whether, whether these, these culture areas meant anything in terms of the prehistoric developments in the past, and, and, and that's something that some of us have written challengingly about. Uh, but whether they, they, they meant anything in the past, they sure as hell mean something today in terms of the formation and, and the training of archaeologists. So that South people trained in the US Southwest tend not to know much about Mesoamerica. In fact, sometimes it's kind of staggering how little they know about Mesoamerica. Mexican archaeologists are trained in Mesoamerica. Even if they're working in uh, Sonora or working in Chihuahua, they are trained in Mesoamerica. Uh, the consequence is that they bring a very different perception to it. Now, one of the major issues, of course, in Southwest archaeology, and an issue that I've addressed in a couple of places, is the relations with Mesoamerica. And one thing greater knowledge of Sonora and all is doing for us is showing that this whole idea of a Southwest and a Mesoamerica is just too simple. It's just not, doesn't cover the complexities of what's going on. Uh, and uh, we have a, a very much emphasis on what's a region that's referred to as West Mexico, which would be south of Sonora, it would be Sinaloa, Nayarit, uh, Michu well, not Michoacan, but see, well, yeah, Michoacan, uh, Jalisco, Sinaloa, Nayarit, uh, this region uh, going down uh, the west coast of Mexico. And this is a region that's only, I gotta be careful here, because my <laughs> friends at work, they get unhappy if I say it's not part of Mesoamerica before AD 900, but, I'm not the only one that thinks that, uh, but if it's a region that up until AD 900 is, has its own trajectory, and whether you want to call it Mesoamerican or not, we can leave to the, to the labels. Uh, and it's a trajectory that includes and involves what's going on, Elisa and I have argued, all the way up here to Holocom. Uh, and this is an understanding that comes from, rather than starting north and looking south, starting south and looking north. So, A couple of quick things before I start getting into details here. A couple of quick things about uh, Sonora. Like I said, Sonora is about two-thirds the size of Arizona. So, you know, it's almost as big as Arizona. It's the second largest state in Mexico. Chihuahua is the largest. Uh, it is uh, basically environmental, in terms of environmental zones, there are three major environmental zones, and they run north to south. And I think I have a pointer here. Can I? Okay, yeah. There are three major, I mean, these are archaeological cultures, but there are three major uh, environmental zones that run north to south. There's the, the Sierra Madre, or sometimes called the Sierra, Sierra Madre de Sonora. There is a, the, Sera, the Serrana, which is the foothills. Uh, the Sierra Madre is tall mountains uh, with pine trees and, you know, think mount, top of Mount Lemon. That's what the Sierra Madre looks like. And then the uh, Serrana is the foothills of the Sierra Madre. This is mainly grasslands and oak, oak uh, scrub forests. Um, and then you have the Sonoran Desert or the Coastal Plain, uh, which is Sonoran Desert and, you know, it in, in differs in some ways, but generally looks like what you see if you leave Tucson, you know. 
I mean, it's, uh, you know, we are at the northernmost edge of the Sonoran Desert here. There's a bit more variety of different kinds of cactus, cacti and all as you go south, but it's, it's basically pretty similar to this. Uh, and then this all ends when you get down to Sinaloa, right here. If any of you know Alamos in Sonora, uh, at Alamos you're, you're getting a transition from Sonoran Desert to uh, tropical th uh, thorn forest. Uh, and Alamos is right in the transition zone of that. And when you get into Sinaloa, you're in uh, tropical thorn forest. The Sonoran Desert does not extend into C Sinaloa. So there is a major uh, environmental break uh, at that point. Uh, and then, of course, one of the things that makes this region very distinctive from the rest of the southwest northwest is you have a coast. You have a coast and you have a seashore running all along this. Now, in the uh, habitation in that region is less than you might assume because there are uh, a number of major rivers, starting with the Magdalena River up here, and then the Rio Sonora down here, and then the Rio Mayo and the Rio Yaqui down here, that, that rise in the Sierra Madre and then flow down and flow through the uh, coastal plain uh, into the ocean uh, when there's a lot of water. A lot of times they don't flow all the way to the ocean. And you have uh, gaps of about 100 kilometers or more between each of these rivers where there's essentially no potable water. So this, is, this structures, this, this uh, environmental relation structure the, uh, you know, structure the archaeology. Now the archaeological heritage in Sonora is long and complicated. I'm going to talk, just mention Paleo-Indian archaic and, and get into the formative stuff because the formative stuff is what I do. And of course what I mean by formative is, uh, the term formative is used in uh, Mesoamerica to refer to essentially the, North, the American Neolithic. So, you know, I'm talking about things equivalent to Ho'okam, Mogio, and that kind of thing. Uh, there is a very pronounced and uh, intense uh, Clovis op occupation in Sonora. Uh, there are probably more, I, I might bet there are more Clovis sites in Sonora than Arizona. Uh, it, it, it could, that, that, that could be a, bet a bettable position. Um, uh, you know, it may or may not be correct, but it's certainly one you could start with. Um, uh, Clovis, I, I, I'm assuming that uh, Clovis is, of course, one of the earliest, uh, earliest, uh, oops, is one of the earliest time periods we have in North America. Uh, you're looking at about uh, 11,000 BC or so for Clovis, uh, and this this map here shows some of the major sites that uh, uh, are there. Now, one that has attracted quite a bit of attention lately, been about five seasons of work. Uh, they're not working there now. Is Fin del Mundo which is also a site that's given us some of our earliest Clovis dates, uh, I think 1350, uh, uh, 1350 before uh, the, the Common Era, or before present, I'm sorry, not before the Common, 1350 before uh, uh, present is, I believe, the oldest uh, date they have. And this is a site where they have habitation, they have kill, uh, kill site also here, um, very, very large, intensive uh, uh, Clovis site. Uh, the Clovis uh, really looks like that in southern Arizona. There is no border. Uh, of course, that's one point, uh, Bill kind of made this point, but uh, one point uh, I guess I should make again is uh, the border has no effect on any of this archaeology because it did not exist. <laughs> okay. Uh, it, is, it is, of course, a recent phenomena. We have uh, early and uh, 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 middle archaic developments, and again, these look a lot like what we see in southern Arizona. Uh, and uh, with, uh, you know, Pinto San Jose, Chiricahua, uh, all of this kind of development. This is also true when we get to the late archaic, early agricultural period. And we have uh, a number of uh, late archaic, early agricultural sites uh, in uh, Sonora. The most famous of these is the site of La Playa. Uh, this site, uh, Jim's been working there. I, I actually swore for years uh, that I would never work at La Playa. Uh, <laughs> Uh, because it is a, a very, very striking site. It covers 10 square kilometers, which is an immense area. It is a very striking site. Uh, a lot of it is heavily eroded, like you see in this picture. Here, I keep using my pointer there, but that doesn't work. As you see in this picture down here, uh, it is uh, heavily eroded. Uh, this area right here, this is all burnt rock. Uh, the entire site is covered with burnt rock. It's one giant burnt rock midden, if that means anything to you. Um, and um, 
Yeah, we, we, I remember once we were giving a talk in the town of Trincheras, which is the nearest town to here, and the people asked us if there had been a volcano there because there was all this burnt rock. We said, nope. <laughs> it's all from Ornos, from earth ovens. Uh, and a very, very complicated site. Uh, and I, I got, uh, finally got sucked into working with it because uh, Elisa Viapondo and the Ina crew had found some early Trincheras tradition uh, occupation stuff in there. And so we came in, and they had done some excavation. We've done some more, uh, followed up on some earlier work. We've done some more work with uh, archaeomagnetism, and, or, or archaeomagnetic survey. And we also came in and uh, dro flew drones so that we finally have a map of La Playa. It's not totally done, but it's, we're working on it. But uh, finally, we, we're going to have a detailed map of La Playa. So I got sucked into that one. Um, the earliest occupation material at La Playa is probably Clovis in age. And, uh, but most of what you see and most of what uh, people find is uh, early agricultural. And this early agricultural stuff is very much, uh, very much similar, uh, very much the same, if you will, to uh, what's going on here in southern Arizona. So again, uh, you know, what's going on in Sonora looks very much like what's going on here in southern Arizona, which given that we're talking about a fairly uniform environment shouldn't be terribly surprising. Now, where my interests really lie uh, is when we start talking about the formative. And uh, formative is a, a term that's used in Mesoamerica for what also could be called the uh, North American or the Americans, uh, the Neolithic of the Americas. This is once we have people who are living in villages and you know, making pottery and growing corn and beans. And, and of course, you know, we used to think all those things happened at once, but that's a different talk. Hopefully you guys realize <laughs> that the big, finding of, uh, in Southern, uh, the big finding in early agricultural archaeology 20 years ago was it didn't all happen at once. Each of those things came at a different time. But they do finally all come together, and that's when we call it the formative. And the, one of the places where this looking north versus looking south stuff comes into play is that in Mesoamerica, in northern Mesoamerica, we have uh, the, the Chubicaro culture, uh, which is the early, earliest formative uh, in this region. And this is material, this is material from West Mexico. And uh, these figurines, uh, coffee bean-eyed figurines, uh, other, other similarities, um, corded designs, uh, red on brown, red on buff, uh, red on, uh, you know, uh, pottery. Uh, I might add that, you know, we think when you work in the southwest, you think the whole come are really special because they make red on buff pottery, you know, and nobody else makes red on buff pottery. Well, all down the coast of West Mexico, you find red on buff pottery, <laughs> all down the coast. But uh, this, all of this looks very much like uh, very early, um, early on, uh, you know, very early uh, uh, formative archaeology further north, and there is some relationship here, although it's not a simple one. Now, I want to talk first about the Watabampo tradition. Essentially, something that Elisa and, uh, and I have argued previously uh, is that basically, uh, from Hoacom here all the way down this coast, going all the way down into West Mexico, that before about AD 800, 900, that this is a continuous area of continuous development and connection. Uh, so we are uh, uh, agreeing with Eric Reed, who once said that he wished the uh, Gadsden Purchase had never happened so that the Hohokam would have stayed in, in Mexico where they belong. <laughs> okay. so, so we are quite, uh, quite aggressively believe, you know, agreeing with this uh, and arguing that the Hohokam are the northernmost tip before 8800, 900 are the northernmost tip of a, of a series of developments and cultural developments that stretch all the way down into West Mexico, which would put you down in Nayarit, Colima, uh, 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 down, uh, down in that region down there. And the Guadabampo tradition reflects a lot of this. The Guadabampo tradition is in southern, uh, is in, I can't quite see the map, so I think I'm pointing to the Guadabampo there. It's in southern Sonora and into northern uh, Sinaloa. And it's clearly defined up until about 900 in the Common Era. These are some of the polished redware vessels uh, that characterize uh, this tradition. The uh, very first project I ever worked on in Mexico was actually uh, in, uh, in Guadabampo. It was an Ina project, and I was uh, you know, along for the ride. Um, you also get these anthropomorphic figurines, which if you're familiar with early pioneer period anthropomorphic anthropomorphic figurines from Hoacom, uh, you could probably lose these 
uh, in them. Uh, the other thing we have that goes along that coast, and again goes uh, along that coast, all the way down to Colima, Nayarit, you know, all the way down to the, the southern end of West Mexico, is a shell jewelry tradition, especially bracelets. Um, the, you can get shell, shell bracelets from Colima, and I could throw them into a Hoacom collection, and you could not tell the difference. You know, they would, they would be un indistinguishable. So you have this production all along that coast. Now, there are some things that vary. Uh, for example, we have a lot of, in Trincheras, we have a lot of, uh, ho we have a lot of uh, shell bracelets, but sometimes they have uh, designs etched in them, and those designs are different than Hoacom designs. But the, the concept of the bracelet is, is uh, consistent all the way down. Now, all of this changes in uh, southern Sonora, northern Sinaloa, in, with the appearance of something uh, which is called the Mixteca Pueblo Horizon. This is something that occurs across Mesoamerica, and it is a set of uh, a stylistic, uh, set of uh, stylistic uh, characteristics. It is, uh, yeah, and it, it also architectural, etc that you suddenly see across all of Mesoamerica so that now suddenly uh, things in the Maya area look something like things on the West Coast, uh, which they didn't before, which they absolutely did not before. And in the West Coast, the Mixteca Pueblo is referred to as the Atzatlan uh, by that, that um, time period. And what we would argue is that this is where you see a break in the development or the continuous development of West Mexico through Hoacom is at this time period. Because this does not get north of, uh, this does not get north of Sinaloa. Uh, the Gusave culture of northern Sinaloa, is, and this is what replaces Guadabampo in Sinaloa, is the northernmost that this gets. Um, and now, after this time period, developments and all are more tied to things going on further north, or at least this is the position that, that, that we have taken. Uh, we could be wrong, but one of the things about taking bold positions is then people can go out and try to prove you wrong, and they can get money to do that. <laughs> McGuire, and, uh, McGuire and Villapando said this, and they're wrong, and I'm going to prove it. <laughs> so that funds more research, so yeah, that's a good thing. We have developing in the uh, mountains of, uh, in the mountains or, or along the slopes of the mountains, We've defined two, or two culture areas have been defined down there. One is the Rio Sonora, the other is the Serrana. And this, basically, where these are, this is the Serrana, uh, you know, environmental zone, which, like I said, is, is uh, grasslands, uh, oak, oak forest, or oak, forest is a strong word, little scrubby oak trees. <laughs> okay, I don't, want to, I don't want to see, but get visions of English oak, no, little, little scrubby oak trees, you know. Uh, uh, what you might call chaparral or something like that. And uh, we have, uh, in, in the southern region, we have what's been defined as the Serrana. Uh, the amount of research that's been done on this is very limited. Uh, there is essentially one major project. Uh, at Onavas, uh, which is down in the southern part of the state, uh, this is just examples. Here's, here's some of these bracelets I'm talking about that you'll find going all the way down. Uh, some green stone or some, yeah, some turquoise stone. Uh, this is uh, ceramics from that area. Uh, there's some things about Onavas that are very interesting. One of them is cranial deformation. And uh, I actually probably should let Jim talk about this because I think he actually did the analysis. Um, but uh, the, we had, there, there were a high number of, or high proportion of individuals that had uh, cranial deformation where you know, babies' heads would be bound so that they would create an elongated head. This is something we see in Mesoamerica. The other thing that uh, occurs here that we also see in Mesoamerica is uh, uh, carving out of teeth. That's not the way it's usually put. Um, what, what, what's the proper? Dental modification. dental modification, yeah. Yeah, dental modification, right. Um, I'm a little nervous here because I, I didn't realize until I got up here and put the slide up that Jim's sitting right there. Uh, <laughs> and I'm talking about his analysis, but anyway. Uh, um, so, you know, this is, uh, yeah, so very different stuff going on here. Uh, however, we have uh, very little, uh, you know, very little information. Uh, we literally have two sites excavated, uh, one cemetery and one uh, habitation site. So this is, uh, yeah, not, not, not much we can say here. Uh, but important, but what we do find out, like I said, is very striking. The dental, the, the cranial modification and the dental modification it was, was unexpected and very uh, <coughs> exciting. Now, if we go up further north along the Serrana, still along the Serrana, 
we are into the region that's been called Rio Sonora. And uh, in Rio Sonora, a lot of this looks uh, somewhat like uh, archaeological developments we see in southeast Arizona, like uh, Dragoon and over in that region. Um, we have um, the, uh, uh, here, here is the area. The area is kind of mountainous to, um, mountainous to hilly. Uh, this is work that's been done at Rio Moctezuma by Matt Pales, who did this as his dissertation work here at uh, the University of Arizona. Uh, you're getting rectangular rooms with uh, rock outlines. Uh, we're also getting uh, some uh, corrals and uh, ball courts and things like that going on in this area. Uh, ball court being a, a feature that of course extends up West Mex the West Mexican side. And this just gives you an idea of some of the pottery. It has a, a distinctive pottery that's uh, very distinctive from like the Trincheras tradition stuff where I work, uh, but also very uh, different from further north. Um, some people have seen this as kind of an extension of Mogollon. Uh, I suppose you can do that, but to do that basically you're saying, if it's brown, where it's Mogollon? <laughs> Which gives us half of the formative of, of, of uh, Mexico in, nor in North America. Uh, but uh, so very different things going on down here. And we, we have a bit more uh, on Rio Sonora than we do on Serrana. Uh, we have Matt's work and the work of his father, which was done back in the 1970s. So we have a bit more going on there. Now, what I've worked on and what has been the focus of my work has been the Trincheras tradition, which is uh, directly south of us here. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, the, 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 board, the boundary uh, comes about to the border. It, it dips north in a few places and dips south in a few places, but the, the border is roughly the, the uh, division between Hoacom and Trincheras. Uh, when I started uh, our work, the basic ideas about Trincheras tradition and how to uh, define it were either it was Hillbilly Hoacom, which was Doc uh, Emil Howry's, interpretation of it, or uh, Charlie DePeso's interpretation of it, which was, it was, guess, you, you, those of you who know Char who knew Charlie, you can probably guess, Mesoamerican Outposts. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, all of these things defining it as uh, something from the outside in. Uh, one of the things we've been, I think, fairly easily successful at demonstrating is it's neither of those things. It is a tradition in its own right. Uh, it is distinctive from Holocom. Uh, a lot of ways, that there are a lot of distinctions between it and Hoacom. There are similarities, they're in very similar environments, so there, there are similarities, but um, there are also, uh, you know, very major differences. Uh, one of the most obvious is that Hoacom pottery is paddle and anvil. The, the coils are built up, and then um, uh, to smooth them out, you take a stone and you hold that on the inside and you have a wooden paddle. And so you have an anvil and a paddle, and you, and you paddle it out, and that's how you form uh, the vessel. Uh, Trincheras vessels are, are a method called coil and scrape, where you build up the coils, and then you take a, a sherd, an old sherd or a stone, and you scrape the inside to obliterate uh, the coils. All right, so these are very distinctive uh, ways of making pottery, and they're quite, honestly, uh, they're, they're quite easily uh, identified. Uh, so the Trincheras tradition... Uh, if, uh, and on this and other bases is clearly a, a, a development in its own right, uh, not independent of Hoacom. Although one of the interesting things we find in, with Trincheras tradition is we find very little evidence of uh, direct interaction with Hoacom, which is kind of intriguing because, of course, the Hoacom are right. Oh, sorry. I'm forgetting what I can do here. The Hoacom, of course, are right here. But we find more evidence of, in, of, uh, of uh, interaction with uh, Casas Grandes than we do with Hoacom. Um, and this has led us uh, to, uh, Lisa and I to argue, and I, I maybe can get into it in a little bit here, uh, that in fact there was a, st a standing period of warfare and all between the two regions, but I'll, I'll get back to that. Um, just as an example, those of you who know Tucson Basin archaeology or Papagorean archaeology are familiar with a type called Tanka Verde Red on Brown. You know, if you work around here, you find tons of Tanka Verde Red on Brown. We do the, I'm working right now in the Altar Valley, uh, Altar Valley Sonora, which is not the same as the Altar Valley Arizona. Um, and uh, we have none. You know, it's, it's right like here. And, and we have none. No Tanka Verde Red on Brown, which is kind of surprising. But. So uh, Sarah, uh, the term Trangeras is a little... Uh, a little confusing because it's been used also 
to refer to a site, a site type, which are Cerros de Trincheras. And uh, basically, Cerros de Trincheras are uh, sites with terraces and walls that are built on isolated volcanic hills. Uh, and so this covers a lot of ground. And they occur in three or four different culture areas. They occur in Casas Grandes, they occur in Rio Sonora, they occur in Trincheras, they occur in Hoacan. Uh, but not always in the same forms or at the same time period. They also occur very early. Um, this site right here is in, um, is in Chihuahua. This is an early agriculture site. So this is like 1500 BC. Okay. And then you have a reassertion of these in the formative period much later. And quite honestly, uh, something some of my colleagues might disagree with me about, but uh, uh, I, I see no connection. There, there's not a continuum of this uh, through that time. In, up here in Tucson Basin, see these are, these are ones, this is here, that's Tucson. <laughs> uh, and um, uh, up here in the Tucson Basin, these, these uh, primarily appear in the Tanca Verde phase. Uh, they do not uh, appear, seem to appear earlier. Uh, and they seem to drop out with the Tucson phase, and they, they primarily uh, occur with the Tanca Verde phase. Uh, this is the site of Cerro de Trincheras, with, uh, which Bill's already mentioned. Uh, and this is, um, this is uh, uh, you know, a, a tr Trincheras tradition, Cerro de Trincheras, which gets even more confusing because the, the main site is called Cerro de Trincheras, and then the site type is Cerros de Trincheras. It gets people very, very confused. Um, you know, Bill was talking about how brave Adriel Heisley was. Uh, he did his first archaeological photography with us, as, as Bill was saying, at Cerro de Trincheras. And he came by and he says, Randy, there's, the light's not good enough for me to do photography, but I got some gas left. Do you want to go up? <laughs> so I said, yeah. And uh, it was before, it was when he was using the ultralight that Bill showed you the picture of. But in the, the ultralight Bill showed you the picture of, he had a, he had a storage uh, a storage thing there, and uh, before that there was a seat. <laughs> and so after I got out over the fear that I was going to fall out, it was actually quite entertaining. It was quite uh, quite wonderful uh, to 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 get up there and do it. But anyway, in terms of uh, some of our other work we've done, these are two sites in the um, uh, Altar Valley, uh, the site of Cerro de Trincheras is in the Rio Magdalena. These are in the Altar Valley. Um, and we did, uh, we did a study. Uh, this is Tio Benino. If you look very closely, you can see the terraces. Uh, and this is La Hormiga, or Cerro de la Hormiga, which is the anthill. It would be the translation uh, of that. Uh, and uh, what we did, this is the top of uh, Tio Benino. Again, you can, see the, uh, you can see the terraces. What we did is we mapped uh, both of these sites and did controlled surface collections off of them. Uh, we then, of course, we had done excavations at Cerro de Trincheras, so we had... Uh, you know, we had uh, that information, and we used um, uh, an analysis called least cost uh, path analysis uh, to try to decide if these terraces were defensive or not, uh, because these terraces could, in fact, facilitate uh, climbing the hill as opposed to inhibit it. And so we wanted to, we used this uh, least cost path analysis. Jeff Amy at the time came out and helped us uh, with the, uh, with the, he, he was my rod man. I was out there with the total station. And um, uh, what we found was that the uh, terraces increased the difficulty of climbing the hill by a factor of anything from three to five times, uh, depending on the hill. And what we were able to also define was what was like behind being defended and what was not. Uh, and we think what was being defended against was the expansion of Hoacom people into the uh, Altar Valley, which occurred at about AD 1300. Um, because that's we start to see Hoacom in, in, the, in the Altar Valley at about AD 1300. In the middle Magdalena Valley, this is where Cerro de Trincheras is. This is Cerro de Trincheras. Early, early on, we have a term which I, I tried to get out of the literature when I started, but uh, Paul and Susie Fish uh, screwed me up <laughs> and insisted on continuing to use it, which is corrals. Uh, these are circular, square walls, uh, walled structures. Here's one right here. See the wall right here? You can see the uh, wall right there. Uh, and these are, uh, have been traditionally referred to as corrals. Uh, they are not, uh, because these people didn't have domesticated animals. I mean, they might have had turkeys, they would have dogs, but they didn't have sheep or cattle or anything you'd put in a corral. Uh, but that term has uh, stuck. And um, 
uh, Paul and Susie did a survey in the area of uh, Cerro de Trincheras, and we defined a whole bunch of, uh, in the early, uh, early period, a whole bunch of uh, little uh, villages, towns, or villages really, not towns, hamlets, uh, that would have been pet house sites uh, with these corrals on a number of these uh, hills around them. Uh, with, you know, an implication that there, we're, we're, you're dealing with something that has to do with, uh, you know, uh, ritual or something like that. Um, just to give you an idea, uh, the kind of defining, you know, in the, in the Southwest, uh, you know, if you do anything, it's got to be based in pottery, right? You know, you know everything's got to come down to ceramics. So these are Trinchera ceramics. And uh, before uh, what's referred to the Saros phase, which is about 1250, 1300, uh, we have uh, types called Trincheras purple and red. One of the things we're working on in our current work is to try to break that down into more types. Uh, the idea that we only have one ceramic type over a period of a thousand years is not likely uh, or useful. Uh, but uh, this is, uh, and some of this paint is uh, specular. It's uh, got, uh, it sparkles, it, you know, uh, and uh, yeah, so that, that's, that's interesting. Now, uh, we also have a distinctive um, rock art style. This is a rock art from a site called La, La Nana, which is near Sao de Trincheras. Some of you may be aware, or you may know, uh, that there's a site called La Providora outside of Coborca, uh, Coborca, Sonora. And La Providora is probably one of the largest uh, rock art sites in North America. I won't say probably, it's easily one of the largest rock art sites. Thousands and thousands of uh, panels, well not panels, but uh, examples, dozens and dozens of panels uh, with rock art on it. Uh, but the, the uh, rock art is distinctive from Ho'okam. You, if, you're, if you're working with Ho'okam rock art, you're not going to get confused here. You're not going to go, oh, I'm back in Phoenix. No, that's not going to happen. Uh, so it, it, it is uh, you know, quite distinctive in terms of what's being shown and all. Um, these examples, unfortunately, there's, a, there's one common uh, form that is that are, are people, uh, kind of stick figure people, but they have halos around the heads. Either halos or, 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 or space helmets or something, but, you know, uh, but anyway, so it is quite distinctive. Uh, you have a shell, uh, shell production, which is related, again, this, uh, this idea of shell bracelets goes all the way down the west coast. Uh, you cannot tell a finished shell bracelet if it's not if it hasn't been you know, modified with decoration, you cannot tell a finished Trinchera shell bracelet from a finished Holocom shell bracelet. But they're made with uh, quite different techniques. Uh, on the Trincheras, they uh, cut off uh, what we call a tapa uh, to create the hole here. And then they use one of these uh, tools like this to, to bore it out. Uh, on a Holocom bracelet, you knock a hole in the top, and then you just break little bits out. Uh, which leads, although the finished bracelets look identical, the debitage is quite distinctive. Uh, because we get lots of these things, and with Holocom you get just lots of little broken bits of uh, shell. So, And we got lots of shell at uh, Cerro de Trincheras and at La Playa. Both of those places have lots and lots of shell. Now in the Cerros phase, which is the only phase I would argue we've really uh, excavated, clearly defined, uh, when we started our project at Cerro de Trincheras in the 1990s, we were actually quite surprised to find out that it's a single component site. Uh, we did not anticipate that. It is, uh, over, there are over 900 terraces. We would estimate the population of at least 1,000, but probably no more than 2,000 people at the site, which for, uh, for Southwest Northwest, that's a good sized town, you know, that many people. Um, but we really uh, only were able to define, we, we have at this point, 40-some C14 dates, and all but one of them falls in the range of about 1,300 to 1,450. Uh, and the other, the other telling thing is one of the things that happens with the Saros phase, which is 1,300 to 1,450, is that uh, the production of painted pottery drops out. They're not making purple on red pottery. And we have a million shirts coming to a full metric ton <laughs> from Cerro de Trincheras. We have... 10 purple and red shirts. All right. So uh, amazingly, this site is single component. We, that is not what we anticipated. Uh, quite the opposite of what's happening in the project I'm working on right now, where we have what we thought was a single component site, and it's not. But anyway, uh, the Cerros phase, we've, we've done quite a bit of excavation at Cerro de Trincheras. By chance, there is, uh, let's see, 
uh, the site is right here. And by chance, there is uh, behind the site, uh, there, uh, Paul and Susie uh, survey found all these little hamlets scattered around uh, the valley. And initially, we had dug uh, some pit houses that were behind the um, that were behind Cerro de Trincheras. And initially, we thought they were somehow associated with the uh, with the, the hill and with the terraces. And uh, what we found out after with Paul and Susie's survey was that they were just by chance the closest hamlet to the hill. So we uh, excavated one of those, and so we have uh, you know good data from those. And uh, I apologize, Elisa did these slides for me, and uh, I thought I had uh, I thought I'd translated all of them, but uh, apparently I haven't. Um, we have uh, solstice markers on the peak of this, and there's another one here. This one mar marking the uh, uh, winter solstice. This one marking the summer. Uh, we have. Uh, right, up, uh, right up in here, we have an area that we think is an area of elite uh, habitation, a whole bunch of reasons for this having to do with the structures that are there, where it's placed on the site, and the artifacts that we found. Uh, there are over 900 terraces on the hill, uh, over 300 um, rock structures, square and round rock structures. And uh, we have two major kind of ritual areas, one of which is down here, I'll show you a picture of it in a minute, which we call La Concha. Uh, which is a broad open area that would have been open and visible to everybody on the site. And then up on top, we have one called the Caracol. Again, I'll show you a picture in a minute. Uh, and it looks like a, a seashell cut in half. Uh, and that would have been uh, very private, uh, being up on the site and uh, with controlled, uh, again, our, uh, uh, our uh, least, uh, least cost efforts uh, analysis suggests that we had a controlled access to the top here. Um, that, you know, yeah. And then this is just some of the, so just to give you an idea of some of the artifacts. Uh, interestingly enough, we are not getting, I think we have one shirt of Gila, uh, polychrome. Again, if you're familiar with what's going on here in southern Arizona, you don't get tons of Gila polychrome, but you get Gila polychrome. You know, you, you get a few shirts of it. We don't. Uh, what we get instead is this, which is Ramos polychrome from uh, Casas Grandes, um, which is much, much further away. And here, what I love, uh, copper bells. Yeah. We have five copper bells. So it would have come from Kalima, Nayarit. That's where copper bells come from. Um, two of them still have the stones in them. And when you're the director, you can take them and hold them to your ear and listen to the sound of the bell. Nobody else gets to do that. <laughs> <laughs> And, I, and I'm sure if any of you work in artifact conservation, you're going, what? You did what? Yeah, every time I pick them up. I <laughs> uh, actually, if you go to Cerro de Trincheras, it's been developed for uh, visitors by uh, the INA, by the Instituto Nacional de Anthropology and Historia. And uh, they, have a, um, they have a reconstruction, digital reconstruction of the site that was done by Doug, Doug Gann with uh, Archaeology Southwest. And um, uh, they have a, a musical score behind it, and uh, you know, kind of, you know, the usual, you know, it, it's all flute music, right? But but in addition to the kind of usual fluty stuff, uh, the, they they recorded the tinkling of the bells, and those are part of the of the score, which is I think really really neat. Uh, and anyway, just to give you an idea of artifacts, what kind of things that we find associated with it, we get lots of tecamates, this is or seed jars. Um, this is a form we find in. Uh, this is a form we find in, in up in Arizona and all also, but we get a lot more of them. <clears throat> Not sure why, but we do. Now this is the concha. Uh, as I say, this is visible from uh, anywhere on the, the terraces on the site. Uh, we, you know, one of the first theories was this was a ball court. Uh, only problem is uh, you don't play a ball game with a room in the middle of the court. Uh, so we're not sure. We worked really, really hard to try to figure out the stratigraphic relationship of this room to the rest of that feature, and we couldn't do it. We were really quite at a loss uh, about the stratigraphic relationship to the rest of the feature. Uh, I mean, it was put in after this fill was, uh, but anyway. But this is also a very special place. Uh, these terraces, when you stand on them, look flat, but when you measure them, they're not. They're slightly sloped. This one is not. This one is flat. Uh, it's also filled with fill that we think came from La Playa. 
which is about uh, 15 kilometers north of here. Uh, but that's other things. And then on the top of the hill, we have the Caracol, uh, which is this feature here. Whatever went on in there would have been very private. Uh, the, there, to get to this plaza that you see here, you have to go through zigzag gates and, and other things that suggest a, a controlling. Now we also have in Sonora uh, evidence of the Casas Grandes tradition. Uh, a lot of this was initially interpreted as being a result of people fleeing Casas Grandes when it fell. Charlie, Charles de Peso, was of the opinion that the people of Casas Grandes uh, who fled Casas Grandes when it, uh, you know, when it, when it was, oh, well, he would say destroyed, uh, violently destroyed, uh, that they fled to Sonora and became the Opata. Um, could be. No, we, can't, we can't really say this. But one thing we can say now, based on work that uh, the Central Ina has done, is that the uh, presence, this is, this is uh, Casas Grandes in Chihuahua. This is not in Sonora. Uh, but that the presence of uh, Casas Grandes or Pakime uh, materials and sites in Sonora is not simply uh, a phenomena of people fleeing Casas Grandes, that the Casas Grandes use area extended into Sonora, uh, into right over the, divide, the continental divide of the Sierra Madre. And uh, one of the most striking things we have there, this is Hubert de Martinez's work, uh, excavating in, a, in an open air site here, and the most striking things we have are cliff dwellings. Uh, and there's a whole series of cliff dwellings, not quite as, if you're familiar with the ones uh, near Pacame, uh, they're, not the, they're not quite as large as the largest of those, but a whole series of uh, cliff dwellings. This is one of the uh, uh, most dramatic of those. Now, the last area to talk about is the Sonoran Central Coast. And I'm talking about this area right here. Um, realize one of the things I, I said is you have this desert, Sonoran Desert, going you know starting up here and then going all the way down to about there. And through most of this, there is no potable water. There's potable water where you have rivers, uh, Rio Magdalena, uh, Rio uh, the uh, Sonoran River, uh, the Yaqui River, and the Mayo River. Uh, but you have stretches of as much as 100 kilometers between these rivers, and there's essentially little or no uh, potable water. So the, the, the coastal central area has been interpreted very much. And for some reason, I have a blank slide coming up. I'll skip right over it. And, this, it, and what we see here is, uh, uh, has been interpreted as a continuum into Siri, uh, modern Siri. Uh, Siri peoples are interesting for a variety of reasons. Uh, one thing that makes them uh, interesting is that they are uh, human speakers, uh, the same language family as the uh, humans and the, uh, uh, the, the Kokopa and the other people of the Colorado River. But the uh, Seri are also human speakers. Uh, and we have uh, uh, some archaeology that's been there. Lisa Villapando's initial work was in this region. One of the most dramatic of uh, these sites is uh, La Pintada. And the site of La Pintada is uh, just south of Hermosillo. It is uh, associated with Siri. Uh, it seems to have occupation of uh, several hundred years. And the striking thing about it are all these paintings. The, the cliffs are, are, are you know, in such a way that these things are in not full, not full shelters, but they're recessed enough uh, that these painted uh, designs survive. And uh, we also then have evidence uh, at the, and there's a stream that runs through, not surprisingly, there's a stream that runs through these, uh, through this, this little cliff, this little valley. And uh, we have uh, Seri pottery and, uh, you know, uh, evidence for Seri occupation right at the mouth of the, of the river. And this is the most uh, kind of dramatic of these. Now, one final point is that as is true in Arizona, in uh, Sonora, uh, we, the living descendants of the people who did all of this are, are still around. Uh, the only exceptions to this, and I, I say this with some hesitation, but uh, taking the traditional position that only uh, uh, exceptions to this are the Opata. Uh, the last known Opata speaker died in the 1950s, uh, and uh, there have not been people identifying as Opata. I'm being very hesitant about this because uh, about five years ago, Mexico changed its indigenous law, its, its law, 
for that re related to Indian people, and did it in such a way that there are now some advantages to being identified to, as Indian, which was not the case before. In fact, it was quite the contrary before. Uh, and so there are various groups kind of uh, reestablishing re re identities. And I don't know that this is going on in the Opata, but if you were to tell me, oh yeah, so-and-so uh, and so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so are, are, are lining up the Opata, I'd go, okay. You know. um, but anyway, uh, and this is the work of Nat uh, Natalia Martinez, uh, again, her dissertation work here, uh, working with archaeology of the Seri people, the Komaka. Uh, and I think one of the things that uh, characterizes uh, our work in Sonora is collaboration. Um, you, in most of Mexico, when you have gringo pot projects working in Mexico, uh, the project will be all in English. Uh, almost all the participants will be uh, U.S. Uh, researchers or U.S. students. Uh, there'll be a few token Mexican students. The language of the project will be English, the, everything like that. Uh, we in Sonora, uh, those of us who go to Sonora, and it's not just me, it's everybody else, Jim, everybody else who does it, do so in a cooperative way, collaborative way, uh, working closely with the Centro Ina. Uh, and this is, uh, we're not the only people, only gringos working in Mexico doing this, but Sonora is the only state in Mexico that I can say that's the way you do it, that it's the, that it's the expectation. Uh, the other places are, are, are different. So this is uh, one of the things that's really been good, and I think a lot of this, I always give Elisa credit for this, and she always says I should give credit to Tita Braniff, who is the woman who established the uh, Centro in Sonora. But anyway. So uh, hopefully there are questions, because that's what I have. <laughs> with the trinchera, with, you know, we see a, a general pattern in the US Southwest, whereby you have uh, increasing populations that really start to shoot up when you get, uh, Bill can jump on me, because. Uh, Archaeology Southwest has worked on this problem, but uh, you know that really starts to ramp up at maybe a thousand or so, uh, and then they peak around 14, 1450, and then we see a, a massive decline. That pattern holds for Trincheras tradition. Okay, that we we have that same pattern. Um, outside of that, we don't have enough. Um, we don't have enough data for me to say. Uh, yeah, so I would be giving you a wild guess. Uh, you know, if, if you wanted me to give you a guess, Saros phase, which would be the peak of Trincheras tradition, you want, to give me, you want me to give you a guess, maybe 10,000 in the whole Trincheras tradition, and that's really just a guess. You know, it's probably, all, well, certainly smaller than Holocom. In part because Holocom covers a much larger area and we have a lot bigger sites. I mean, the site of Cerro de Trincheras stands out because the next largest site to it is like four times smaller. Oh, gosh, boy. You've, you've put in so many layers. You don't realize it, but you've put in a number of layers there. You're, and you're referring to the Azatlan site, which is in Wisconsin. Wisconsin, yeah. I was going to say Minnesota, but I'm sure Wisconsin is right. Um, that site, all right, they're, they're OK. <laughs> in the, okay, I'm, I'm going to try to keep this simple. In the 1840s, uh, 1848, I believe, a guy by the name of Walter Prescott published a book in English, which was an account of the uh, Spanish conquest of Mexico. Okay, basically, he translated some stuff from Spanish. A lot of people in, and, and in the mid 18th century, 19th century, this was a book that any well-read American would have read. Okay? And that's where the term Azatlan, because Azatlan, the term has its origin as the origin place of the Aztec. Okay? And that's how the term Azatlan got applied to that site, is because people from Prescott's work they, they were aware of the term, and they attempted, in part it was, in part, it was part of the, well, yeah, it was kind of along the same lines as some of the mound builder stuff. It was a way to segregate this, this complex past from the modern Indians. And it's, we see the same thing in the Southwest, 
with Montezuma's castle, Aztec, uh, these all reflect the same thing. And it all goes back to this, this book by Walter Prescott uh, uh, on uh, uh, Cortez's con uh, conquest of the Aztecs. Yeah. So, so, so the, 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 the simple answer is that site in Wisconsin has nothing to do with, the name is totally, uh, uh, totally falsely associated with it. Well, the, you, you have, again, the shell bracelets, you know, uh, the two most common shell artifacts in Hohokam and in Trincheras are shell bracelets and conus tinklers. And we see the same general pattern in Trincheras where initially bracelets, you get more bracelets, and then later you get more tinklers. All right, so those things are similar. Uh, a conus shell tinkler you make by just knocking a little hole. So there's not much to differ on that. Uh, but the, the bracelets are being made by very distinctive technologies. And, you know, when we dig, uh, when we dig in uh, Trincheras, when we dig in production areas, we get all these, the, we call them tapas that have been cut out of them. And, of course, you don't in Hocom. Um, beyond that, the bracelets themselves, you can't tell the difference. Now, if they've been decorated, you can because the, uh, the, 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 sim the stylistic repertory of Hocom is different. And, and we don't have, like, we don't have any evidence of shell etching in Trincheras, at least not yet. Although that was actually pretty, pre that's actually pretty rare in Holocom. Yeah, I mean, I think we have maybe a dozen examples, my way off. Maybe 20, maybe I should say two dozen. Two dozen. <laughs> two dozen, yeah. Out of hundred, probably hundreds of thousands of pieces of shell. Yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, but, but again, that is, a, that is the, the bracelet manufacturing is something that goes all the way down that coast. I could take you to Nayarit, I could hand you some bracelets, and you would say these are Holocom bracelets. I could also hand you around and buff pottery down there, too. We, we don't, well, the, the, you, don't, you don't have, we, we have some trincherous tradition um, occupation on the coast, but not a lot because there's no port, potable water. So we do have a few sites that are probably seasonally occupied. Um, some excavations have been done at them, but I don't know that we have a lot in terms of faunal stuff. Uh, at Cerro de Trincheras, we did have some fish bones, but they were, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I don't remember exactly what they were, except that they were riverine fish, you know, um, that would have presumably came out of the Altar, uh, out of the Rio Magdalena. Uh, so. But you don't have, this is, this is one of the things that's interesting, is you don't have big population centers along the coast in Sonora because generally speaking, there's not potable water. I don't know. I mean, you would be talking there about uh, probably modern Oodam, and the familiarity I have with Oodam origin stories and all would not extend, would not extend to, I mean, you know, the basic story is this story about how elder brother comes in and overthrows the Sivani. Now, exactly who the Savani were, you know, um, but, uh, but no. And uh, when it's not clear, I'm, I'm going to be very careful here. Uh, we had a number of Odom people from Cells who came down when we were working at Cerro de Trincheras. And it was kind of like, well, maybe my grandmother told me something about this place, you know. Um, uh, we're now, in fact, I just had a meeting yesterday with uh, some Oodon people in Sonora that we're going to be talking to about our work and all. Uh, but, um, no, I mean, yeah. I guess simple answer is no. Yeah. Well, in, in the Sonoran Desert, you cannot dry farm. None of the agricultural crops, corn, beans, squash, uh, in the Sonoran Desert can you dry farm. Uh, you know, when I, I, I also live in Cortez, Colorado, and you can dry farm beans there, all right? Uh, but you, in the Sonoran Desert, you can't dry farm anything. You've got to do something to bring water to the crop. Either you have to have canal irrigation or you have to uh, construct, uh, uh, you know, walls and dikes and stuff to collect water and bring it, you know, to the spot. Uh, that said, it's much like today. If you can get the water there, you can grow anything. Uh, and, you know, they were growing corn, beans, and squash, and probably a lot of cotton, too, uh, as were the Hohokam. Um, the idea of canal irrigation is actually not that tough. 
Um, somebody here probably knows better than me, I'm going to guess, and somebody can tell me if I'm getting it wrong. I think the earliest canals we have here in the Tucson Basin are 1500 BC. I'm looking around to see if that's about right. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. His people did the work. So, um, but it's about, you know, uh, so we get canal irrigation very early. Uh, and we have some, some evidence for canal irrigation with the uh, Trincheras, but not the kind of stuff you see like in Phoenix, not canals running, you know, 22 miles in length and 10 miles from the river and being big enough to drive a semi truck down, uh, which some of, you know, the, I'm, I'm giving you the extremes here, but, um, you know, like that. Uh, so they, these people were obviously very adept at getting enough water to the crop to grow it. Um, and yeah, and they did. So, so I don't know if that fully answers your question. Uh, in terms of was there more water, uh, probably th there wasn't a dramatic environmental difference. But during certain periods, there's more water. In certain periods, there's less water. And the other major difference would have been that through most of this time period, uh, the streams would not have been entrenched. You know, uh, the, the modern entrenchment of streams happens in the 1890s, I want to say. Uh, there, in fact, you can look at the Tucson paper, and they describe each day how far the Santa Cruz River is cut uh, as it entrenched. It was a very dramatic, sudden thing that happened all over the western United States and northwest Mexico, and I think in a period of four or five years. Again, there are people in the room that might have, have these details better than me. Yeah. Uh, again, they, they would have been roughly the same. There would have been only minor fluctuations. Uh, growing season, um, I mean, you know, again, uh, where I'm working is about the same as Tucson, the environment. And, the uh, you know, rainfall and, you know, uh, temperature is all about the same. So uh, growing season is not a major issue. Um, you can't get two, though. Uh, you can get, it's easy to get one if you can get the water. You know, if you can get the water, it's easy to get one. But you can't get two because corn will not tassel if the daytime temperatures are below 55 degrees. And so in February, like here in Tucson, in February, you know, February, January, those temperatures go that far. And so you can't get two crops, just like in Tucson, using uh, Aboriginal techniques, you can't get two corn crops here. It's one of the reasons, this is a total tangent, but that's one of the reasons that people were so anxious to get wheat, because you could grow wheat in the winter. So you could have a summer corn crop and then you could have a winter wheat crop, which, uh, and the wheat was being harvested on what had been the famine months, the, the time when there was least. But, but we're generally, generally speaking, we're not, seeing, we're not working, in a t working in a time or time periods that were dramatically different. Uh, same basic thing. But you know, if you have a difference between nine inches of rainfall in the year and five inches of rainfall in the year, that does become significant. Well, the main one is Cerro de Trincheras, and it's the only one that's really set up for tourists. Um, La, La Prevedora is, uh, there's a private, uh, private owner owns most of La Prevedora, about two thirds. Um, and he is kind of running a dude ranch operation there. So you can contract with him to get in to see uh, La, La, La Providora. That's the rock art site. Uh, La Playa is not open to the public. And I would discourage people from trying to go there without, uh, without talking to, to Ina. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, but yeah, that's in, in terms of prehistoric or pre-Hispanic, that's pretty much it. Well, Lisa and I have argued, yes, there is. Um, we've argued, see, because in the Altar Valley where we're working now, uh, you have Trincheras tradition materials uh, up until, there's a certain guess here, but about 1300. And then it's replaced by essentially Papagri and Hoakam. Uh, and this is something that uh, Hinton, who was uh, surveying the area for Charlie, for Charles DePeso in the 50s, noticed. And our work has reaffirmed it. Uh, and we've suggested, and then the other thing that happens is, uh, in the middle Magdalena, uh, where Cerro de Trincheras is, uh, you have a massive population increase in, um, at about 1,300. Uh, I'm trying to remember, Paul, is it five times? Yeah, like five times. And Cerro de Trincheras appears. Uh, again, one of the things that surprised us when we dug the site is a single component site. 
So it just appears. Uh, and so uh, we would suggest that's a result of uh, Holocom groups coming in, taking the Altar Valley and forcing people out. Having said that, those are the only two areas in the, in the, in the entire region any archaeology has been done in. So, uh, you know, if somebody wants to prove us wrong, you need to go down and dig somewhere else and show that what we found is wrong, which I'm all for. I'm encouraging that. Uh, I'm not, uh, in fact, uh, uh, I, I cannot claim the expertise of the podium to answer that question. Uh, I have colleagues in this room who are more, uh, more able to answer that question than I am. Uh, I, I only know about it uh, from the standpoint of teaching undergraduates. It is not my research. It's not my research. So. Nice. Yeah. Thank you.